afternoon. Thank you all for coming along. Uh, my name is Professor Martin Hook. I'm the uh, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of Partnerships in the College of Design and Social Context at RMIT, and I'm also the Dean of the School of Architecture and Urban Design. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the people of the Woiwurrung and the Bungarong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of RMIT. RMIT University respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past and present. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. Um, Welcome, everyone. I hope you had a chance to have something small to eat outside. Uh, I would like to begin on acknowledging uh, some of our distinguished guests. Uh, James Flintoff, the CEO of Regional Development Victoria, uh, representing Jala Pulford, the Minister for Regional Development. Steph Ryan, uh, Deputy Leader of the National Party, uh, and also Amy Muir, President of the Australian Institute of Architects Victorian Chapter. Um, well, today, uh, I'd like to particularly welcome you to the launch of this project. Uh, the Balance Victoria initiative is fundamentally an online platform for a discussion on decentralisation of the Victorian population. Uh, we will commission and publish research on the shift away from Melbourne as a place for our population to settle and explore the ideas of uh, significant regional development facilitated by new high-speed transport networks. Uh, this is somewhat ironic that we're meeting today on the day after we lost our number one most livable city on the planet, according to The Economist. I've lived in Vienna, it's freezing, and the coffee is terrible. Um, what I would like to do, uh, we've got a few speakers we'll get through today. Um, before uh, I begin, um, we have a series of uh, articles that we will be releasing uh, over the next few weeks. Um, the first one is in the pack that you collected on your way in. Um, I would like to begin by introducing uh, Jay Grant, who is a partner in the New Haven Group and has effectively been working with RMIT for quite some time. And effectively, uh, Balance Victoria is the outcome of a number of projects that we've been working with him specifically in the realm of the built environment, infrastructure, and bigger questions around transport and regional development. Uh, Jay and his team uh, have kindly sponsored uh, the beginnings of this initiative uh, and have funded a series of projects straight off the bat. Um, Jay, I'll invite to the stage to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for coming out. And uh, it's, it's great to have you all here for this this new beginning, I should hope, for, uh, for our state. So Balance Victoria is the result of over 12 months' work that uh, New Haven Group, our firm, have been undertaking with our friends at RMIT. And I'd like to uh, thank Martin Hook for his involvement, and also Billy and, uh, and Liz, and Paul Minifee, who's here today with us, and also, uh, in absence, uh, Professor Ralph Horn, who was a, who was a driving uh, force behind getting Balance Victoria together for us. Uh, Martin's in good spirits, despite the fact that his name for Balance Victoria didn't win, uh, which was the, the committee for everywhere else. Uh, but we, uh, we, we persist nonetheless. Uh, New Haven sponsored the Balance Victoria initiative for the same reason I suspect most of you are here today. We're searching for answers to an essential question, which is how can we improve the settlement arrangements in this state to achieve the best results for all Victorians? Balance Victoria is an independent, non-partisan arena where the facts about what's happening across our state can be laid out and ideas for our future can be articulated. We will welcome submissions from all quarters. We will welcome arguments for and against decentralisation because the contest of ideas is essential. It is only out of the crucible that the best of our thinking will emerge. Now, we're very fortunate in this country to have a citizenry that are both intelligent and engaged. 
from Menzies Fireside Chats to Paul Keating's boast that you could walk into any pet store and the resident Galar would be talking about microeconomic reform, we know that the best policy is developed when the public are part of the conversation. However, we do know also that long-term planning is never easy, and it never has been. And we were very fortunate last Friday for The Age to republish an article from the 10th of August 1968. So uh, I won't ask you to raise your hand if you're around to read it. And the article is titled this, University hits government on planning for underground. Tube would be, quote, a grave error. And here's some excerpts from this article, which I found very amusing, and some of you might have caught it. The Victorian government's plan for an underground railway has been attacked in a Melbourne University report which warns that to go ahead at present would be a serious mistake. It accuses the government of recommending the expenditure of $80 million without competent planning or research. It says the government has based its limited planning on two assumptions. One, that the city workforce will increase by 40% by 1985 and that the patronage of rail transport to the city will increase. It goes on to say that the city loop, as it were, is not needed because Flinders Street Station bottleneck can be solved by staggering shopping hours in the CBD. <laughs> it also said the construction of marshalling lines on the Newmarket abattoir site would save trains reversing at Flinders Street and cut congestion. The report states that the best alternatives to the project would be improvements to suburban rail and tram systems and the replacement of obsolete rolling stock, some of which had been in regular service for over 30 years. Some things don't change. The immediate short-term problem is the Flinders Street bottleneck for which there are many possible solutions. It does not justify major investment and possibly there are other methods of solution, including those with less cost than the underground. Now, Premier Sir Henry Bolte ducked up to Canberra with the Transport Minister, Mr Wilcox, to meet Prime Minister Gorton and to ask him for a $40 million grant to finance the underground rail project. Uh, the Commonwealth is expected to reject Victoria's submission on the grounds that it's purely a state matter. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So history tells us that uh, the job ahead of us is not easy, but we need as many serious people with serious ideas engaged in a serious debate for us to lay the foundations for our next 50 and 100 years. And New Haven Group is very proud to sponsor this initiative. On behalf of Jeff Moore and our team, thank you all for being here. Cheers. <laughs> Our next speaker, um, who fundamentally, along with uh, Pat McNamara, uh, authored uh, this report that um, is effectively a call to action and fundamentally sets out some very critical agendas that we are looking towards. Uh, the Honorary Steve Brax was elected the 44th Premier of Victoria in 1999 and was one of the state's longest serving premiers. He is chairman of the superannuation fund CBUS and holds three major honorary positions as an advisor to the Prime Minister of Timor-Leste and as director of the Bionics Institute of the Australia Board. He is also the honorary chair of the Union of Education Foundation. Steve, come up, Steve. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin, and to um, the Regional Development Minister, Jala Pulford's Chief of Staff, to Steph Ryan, the Shadow Minister for Regional Development, and, and uh, my former parliamentary colleague, Pat McNamara. We served in the parliament together some time ago. Today I'm going to speak about two key points we raised in our discussion paper. First, the integration of transport uh, land use planning, and second, the private sector taking up a role in supporting a decentralisation program. As you all know, Victoria's population is booming. And with our economy is growing the fastest pace of any state in the nation. But before we involve ourselves in a debate about whether population growth is something we can control in its entirety, let's pause to think about what is happening globally. We live in the fastest growing region of the world at a time when population growth is faster than any other stage of human existence. China has about 56 times more people than Australia, while India is forecast to have more babies born this year than their entire population, that is about 27 million babies born. By 2050, 10 of the largest, 
10 of the 32 largest economies in the world will be in our region. Our neighbours will include five of the world's 12 most populous nations. The Brookings Institute tells us that by 2025, another 1 billion people will enter the global middle class. 90% of them will be nations in our region. This new affluence will bring a desire for more than Australia's resources or access to our universities. It will continue to drive immigration in record numbers. The growth is a real opportunity for our state and also for our nation if we plan for and manage it effectively. Tackling the trifecta of housing affordability, jobs productivity and mobility is where a targeted instructed and structured decentralisation program can make a real and lasting difference. But to be effective, any decentralisation program needs to be built on best transport con connectivity available. The innovation of high speed rail, with speeds of up to 300 kilometres per hour, can induce a transformation of the settlement pattern around the City of Melbourne and regional Victoria. This virtual cycle of transport oriented development that we have witnessed in Melbourne, and we've witnessed it, of course, with the now being constructed Melbourne Metro, with rail crossing removal, with regional rail link, can be applied in a new way for a structured decentralisation program for Victoria. The benefit of integrating long-term land use, zoning density, urban built form and housing types, with the introduction of high speed rail is immense. Such integration can allow for settlements to be planned around the railhead and central commercial areas, and for social infrastructure such as schools, hospitals and universities to be planned. New cities supported by decentralisation would be designed to leverage the benefits of new smart city sustainability and transport technologies as they become available. They can be seized to provide thriving and viable local economies while at the same time functioning through fast rail connectivity as part of Melbourne's greater metropolitan economy. The long-term impacts for our state are real and important. Globally, cities are no longer competing for the best in human, cultural, technical and financial capital. Instead, it is regions or mega-regions that are the hubs of economic growth worldwide. Just 40 of these mega-regions account for roughly two-thirds of the world's economic output and more than 85% of its innovation, while housing just 18% of its population. A decentralisation program for our state can develop a Victoria super-region that offers a single jobs market and agglomeration economic base that can compete with the major centres and major mega-regions in the Asia-Pacific. Victoria the nation's most densely populated state is well paused to establish such a regional economic community using rapid ma mass transport and transit as its foundation for agglom agglomeration or financial and human capital. And the private sector can bring its capital and expertise to the effort, effort and in fact it needs to do so. A quick look into the funding mix for infrastructure in Australia shows that we need to find more ways to include private capital in our investment program. In most developed economies, 40% of infrastructure is funded by governments, with the private sector funding about 55%. With regards to our funding mix, Australian infrastructure is funded in aggregate 44% by the private investment, compared to 55% on our OECD counterparts. Looking into the private and government fixed capital formation data from the ABS national accounts, we can see there's a divergence across sectors. The private sector is heavily involved in ICT investment, providing about 64% of the investment, but is well below OECD benchmarks in transport at about 38% and utilities at only 35% of investment. A planned long-term decentralisation program in Victoria can bring the private sector into the game in a more substantive manner. A planned decentralisation program will bring with it a need to build new and upgrade upgraded existing transport infrastructure, a need for new social infrastructure in education, health, justice, sports, a need for upgraded IT and telecommunications infrastructure, an opportunity to invest in the latest technology, latest energy generation, distribution as well as waste management, and the construction of new built environments to house populations and businesses in new high growth regional cities. 
Such a program would represent a pipeline of multifaceted infrastructure and construction programs which would span across about 30 years. Such certainty over, over a long period can allow for instruments to be developed that facilitate greater private participation in the funding mix. The funding is available if the approaches to attract investment are right. Australia's superannuation assets, for example, totaled 2.6 trillion at the end of March 2018. And internationally, the OECD estimates that as of 2013, the funds managed by institutional investors in OECD countries amounted to nearly $100 trillion. The private sector can, when given ownership of projects, deliver valuable outcomes. A privately partnered program could deliver cost savings in infrastructure delivery, value for money with more private capital being employed to fund infrastructure costs in part or in full, efficient management, private operation of the program saves government from adding public sector, uh, public service for coordination delivery of programs. Quality of outcomes, the private sector can and will employ the best and innovative approaches to the program. Some measures are need considering that can be incorporated to attract private capital. They include, but are not limited to, long-term loans for governments to projects, bundling or grouping many infrastructure projects into a single asset-backed security or fund that can receive investment, public-private partnerships, refinancing of infrastructure assets by governments once they enter the operational stage, and incentivising retirees to take super as an income rather than lump sum, which would enable more investment in illiquid assets and not cash-based assets. After many attempts, we need decentralisation to become the central priority of government in 2018. A real program with bipartisan commitment can see us excel in our long-term planning for the state to deliver a world-class fast rail system for all Victorians, to build a series of new population centres throughout Victoria and initiate policies to bring a growing contribution from the best in, clo in global private sector expertise and capital investment. The challenge, of course, is substantial, but Victorians are as ever equal to it. I, I wish the uh, discussion paper every success and join in the contribution of having uh, contributions to that, this debate in the future. Thank you. And it would only be fair uh, to now allow uh, the Honorary uh, Pat McNamara to uh, uh, have his say. Uh, Pat, of course, was the Deputy Premier of Victoria from 1992 to 1999 and the leader of the National Party in Victoria from 1988 to 1999. During the term of government, Pat held numerous ministerial positions, including the Minister for Tourism, the Minister for Agriculture and Resources. Since leaving Parliament, Pat has served as a member of the MCG Trust, Chairman of the Victorian Bushfire Appeal Fund, Board Member of the Voice of Horticulture Proprietary Limited, representing horticulture across Australia, a Board Member of Wine Victoria, Victorian Councillor of Rowing Australia, uh, and in his spare time, the Deputy Chair of the Goulburn Murray Water. Pat, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Jeff, for that introduction. <coughs> to um, my colleague Steve, um, to Jay Grant, who's uh, been supporting this project, Steph Ryan, uh, representing the opposition parties, uh, James Flintoff, Head of uh, Regional Development in Victoria, representing the Minister. Um, I've got to mention my local CEO of our local government, uh, Steve Crocker. Welcome also. Um, <coughs> Steve uh, and I always got on very well. Um, in fact, after it looked like we lost the 1990 election. We had about five weeks in caretaker mode. Uh, and Steve had a, a chat to me. He said, look, it wouldn't be possible that we could form a coalition. And um, I said, well, you know, I said the best, uh, I'm not sure whether our members are quite ready for that, but I said the, the best uh, that Jeff Kennett's offering me is deputy premier. I said, can you do any better? <laughs> and uh, he said, I'm not sure if uh, his colleagues were quite ready for that. But, uh, 
I'd always look forward to the opportunity and working with Steve. I mean, we worked in a bipartisan fashion in, in many ways over the years, but we come together on this project, which I think is just so critical for the future of Victoria. And politics shouldn't be part of this. This is too important an issue. I think we just need to address it. Steve spoke about uh, two of the four pillars. I'd like to talk about two of the others. And one is setting targets, and the other is looking for uh, areas across the state beyond our largest regional centres. Targets for anything, I think, are essential for any sort of policy. And uh, Dwight Eisenhower made the comment, he said, uh, you, get what you, what you get what you inspect, not what you expect. I think we need to ensure that we actually measure uh, what we're doing and we need to actually have targets as part of that process to measure our performance. And decentralisation needs to be more than just a catch cry. It needs to be something that leads to an actual outcome. So the challenges are out there, uh, and in many cases, well, we know they're more than real. What we're facing today are real challenges that are certainly proving to be almost intractable. We've got the congestion issue, and we see that every day we commute in and out of the centre of Melbourne, or anywhere in Melbourne for that matter. We've got livability issues. We've got housing affordability issues. We've got cost of living. I think all of that needs people to really force to have a rethink on how we actually plan Melbourne and how we deal with its growth for the best interests of all of Victoria and particularly for the citizens of Melbourne. The first step that stands out is our forecasting because it's been abysmal. If we look at all the projections that we've seen over, uh, over decades, we've completely undershot you know, what people have predicted for the growth of Melbourne. We had a, an ABS study back in 2003 that said uh, Melbourne uh, would actually reach uh, 25 million people uh, in, in 2042. So we're 24 years ahead of that target. Um, we've been revising our mid-century population forecast upwards every uh, census since, and we're still not getting it right. Plan Melbourne uh, predicts that Victoria will grow by 4.1 million by 2050, but that figure could easily be five, six or seven. We, we're looking at another 3.4 million people under the Plan Melbourne study uh, and 700,000 uh, going to regional Victoria, uh, and that is see Melbourne with a population of around 8 million. But some estimates are already saying that Melbourne by 2050 could reach uh, 11 million. That's, that's bigger than what uh, London is now. And it's probably worth looking at what London's done in terms of development. London has a population twice the size of Melbourne, but a footprint one-sixth. So the density is one-twelfth of what we've got now. The way in which we've just allowed the suburbs to you know, spread out in terms of serviceability, in terms of connection, in terms of public transport, all of those issues become harder to deliver. So, are we the norm in Australia? I think it's worth having a look at uh, Great Britain, for instance. They've got 66.5 million people at present. Uh, London has a population of 10 million, but there's only one other city, Birmingham, that has a population of more than a million people. So the British, with uh, a land mass in the whole of the UK of 3% of Australia, has managed to have diversification right across the country, far better than what we've achieved. In the USA, with a population of 327 million, there are only 10 cities that have more than a million residents. Australia, with 25 million, we have five cities. We have two cities that have 40% of our population. We have five cities that have 60% of our population. This is not the norm globally. In Canada, the two largest cities, Montreal and Toronto, hold a total of 28% of the country's population. In Japan, the two largest cities, Tokyo and Yokohama, hold less than 10%. What we need in Victoria is not a city-state, but we need a state of cities. And the purpose of decentralisation is not only to reduce the cost that's brought about by our rapidly growing population, which is far in excess of what we even saw during the gold rush period in the 1850s, uh, to ensure that we actually share that economic growth uh, across the state. We need also to have a long-term commitment, and it needs to be a commitment above politics. It needs to be a commitment over a 30-year period. As governments change and go, we need to be bound by that commitment. 
Such a program should set a target. We believe the target should be aiming to get at least half of the predicted growth that is coming to Melbourne into regional Victoria. So out of the 3.4 million people, 1.7 of those need to be encouraged to move to regional Victoria. We're certainly uniquely positioned, and, and Steve has outlined that, where uh, geographically in Australian terms, we're a compact state with a large population growing rapidly, and that provides advantages. It enables us to get uh, high-speed uh, transport uh, through high-speed rail, uh, through a decentralisation program, target areas in the regions, uh, and ensure that uh, we provide an opportunity for those people to either live and work in those new regional cities or to commute easily to the metropolitan area. And I think we'd find over a period of time people might start commuting uh, from uh, an area of, say, 100 to 150 kilometres out where they could get back into the city of Melbourne within 20 to 30 minutes, but over a period of time many of those people will establish their own businesses or take their own professional careers to those areas and develop their businesses there. I think uh, we shouldn't fall into the trap of imagining that a meaningful decentralisation program is impossible uh, because much of our land certainly lends itself to human settlement. We, th we think about Australia as a desolate country, but we have a large proportion of the country is very arable, well watered. In fact, 10 per cent of our country fits into that, in, into that qualification. And that area is larger than the UK and France combined. So we have the space, we have the water, we have the regions that are desperate to share in that uh, economic growth. Uh, unfortunately, we have disproportionate flows that are happening at the moment. So that leads me to the second, second and final point. The task of distributing 1.7 million people into the regions by 2050, we need to have a rethink on how we actually make those settlements happen. And I think we need to look at uh, the growth perhaps in smaller country towns or greenfield developments. And this is for a number of reasons. Our largest regional centres are already growing. Ballarat and Bendigo have been predicted to double from 100,000 to 200,000 each by 2050. And Geelong's on the track to go from its current population of 235,000 to 400,000 in that same period. Some interesting points about the growth of what we'd call the big three regional centres. Firstly, most of that growth is off the back of net migration from neighbouring rural shires. And while we're talking about people leaving Melbourne to those regional centres, that's just not happening. In fact, the total numbers uh, over the last five years on an annual basis that have left Melbourne to go to Ballarat, Bendigo and Geelong is a total of 1,300 people. 188 go to Bendigo a year, 200 go to, uh, to Ballarat and 900 go to Geelong. At the same time, Melbourne's growing by over 120,000 people a year. So significantly, it's, it's, a, it's an insignificant statistic. We need to do more than the same old, same old to, ch to achieve a better outcome. So the current policies are not working, although people espouse a support for decentralisation, we need a game changer. What we need to do, I think, also is to think about those issues when we start talking to people in Ballarat, Bendigo and Geelong, because I think we run into another issue. Do those communities, say communities like Ballarat and Bendigo of 100,000, uh, want, want to grow to 500,000, which they need to, do, need to grow to achieve these targets, or Geelong growing from 235,000 to a million? I suspect there's going to be a radical pushback if that was the policy we tried to direct. We've seen what's happened uh, with the Save Our Suburbs in those ring of suburbs outside of the CBD in Melbourne. We know it's government policy to have infill. So in the queues and the Campbell Wells and these areas to put up two and three and four storey blocks of flats. But we know what the adjoining residents say every time there's a planning application for that to happen. You know, it's the NIMBY approach, not in my backyard. So what are the developers doing? They're going to Point Cook, they're going to Craigieburn, and we see the continual sprawl Los Angeles style. So what we're saying is that we need to identify greenfield sites. They might be within 10, 20 kilometres of one of those regional cities, but they're starting from fresh. And we're dealing with rural shires who actually want the growth, who want to be part of the growth that is happening in Victoria now, who, and the people coming in there understand where the long-term outcome is. And the great advantage, I think, starting with new cities from scratch, 
with, Je with Martin and the, and the guys at the RMIT who have been doing some fantastic work. We have been looking at ways in which we actually create truly smart cities. We look at ways in which those cities could be energy self-sufficient you know, with uh, renewable energy, with battery storage, with recyclable water, total capture of storm water, all the efficiencies that we need to have. Two types of <coughs> piping systems, one for your garden, one for your drinking water. Uh, so we'd be using a fraction of the amount of water on a per capita basis or a household basis to be, that you'd be using in Melbourne. And I think it would also open up the state to some great things in terms of innovation. I'm totally excited about this concept and so is Steve and, and we, we didn't hesitate when we were invited to be part of it. But we think it needs an approach where we've all got to be passionate about this, we've got to get out and sell it. We, we've got to see the opportunity where people living, as I said, 100 kilometres out of Melbourne can get into the city in 20 minutes or 150 kilometres out of Melbourne you know, in, in 30 minutes or living you know, further, further, even further afield at 200 kilometres could get there uh, in about 40 minutes. So on a Friday night, if you want to go to the football or if you wanted to go to a show or a dinner in Melbourne any night of the week, it's something you could commute up and down very easily. And I think that's the game changer for Victoria. This is not something that we're putting up as a thought piece. It is a thought piece. It's a thought piece we hope people do think about. But it's something that actually needs to be acted on and it needs to be acted on promptly. Thank you. One of the things which I think is critical um, that it, both of our speakers raise is the, the manner in which we need to actually collaborate around these issues. The government can't do it by itself, uh, industry can't do it by itself, and we think that the university sector is perfectly placed in order to contribute significantly in our understandings of, from our position, how research will inform the ways in which we go about making these decisions. RMIT as a global university of technology design and enterprise is also specifically positioned in order to contribute to ideas around what new cities should look like, uh, the manner in which the transport to those cities should be facilitated, and to really understand how we might begin to embrace new technologies that facilitate ways in which those cities are able to be healthy, prosperous places to live. Um, we're going to have a couple of our key researchers uh, make brief presentations about the work that they're doing. Uh, first, we have Dr. Elizabeth Taylor uh, from the uh, Centre for Urban Research. Uh, and the Centre for Urban Research is really a core focus point around transport, the ways in which our cities are able to evolve and change, but also really looking at the manner in which we can uh, draw on data and real information that might begin to inform and allow us to understand policy. Elizabeth. Okay, thanks to Jay for inviting me to speak and to the preceding speakers. Um, when I started my PhD, which was about 10 years ago, I was actually interested in what were then high profile claims around the impact of planning on housing affordability. But what I ended up doing was opening my PhD thesis with a quote from a rather obscure 1923 novel by Sinclair Lewis called Babbitt. That book is largely about what's called boosterism, which is, I guess, bragging about a town. But there's this one passage that I really like about Babbitt's neighbour, Howard Littlefield, PhD, publicity counsel of the Zenith Street Traction Company, who could, on 10 hours notice, appear before the Board of Aldermen or the State Legislature and prove absolutely, with figures all in rows and with precedents from Poland and New Zealand, that the streetcar company loved the public and yearned over its employees, that all its stock was owned by widows and orphans, and that whatever it desired to do would benefit property owners by increasing rental values and help the poor by lowering rents. So one reason I find that funny now is that it shows um, a tram company in America actually making a lot of money, which was something that quickly changed when car companies came along, including actually literally buying up streetcar networks just to rip them out. The other reason I like it is that it, it really points to this inevitable dilemma with any kind of planning intervention, which is that you can claim to benefit property owners by increasing rents and help the poor by lowering rents, but of course, 
they kind of cancel each other out. And there's just inevitably a paradox where planning is involved in allocating rights, property rights, and they have economic value. And that's something I think we should just, well, embrace and kind of evaluate. A lot of my research since then has looked at the dilemmas of, or the challenges really of land and transport planning and integration in Victoria from this perspective, focusing on property interest groups and their influence on urban consolidation policies. So I looked at um, where homeowners are most engaged with um, what was mentioned before, like fighting off infill housing developments in the suburban backlash. I also looked at the windfall gains that are made by extending the urban growth boundary um, and at the contested efforts to try to tap into that windfall gain through uh, betterment taxes. We're actually seeing some funding from that now. I've recently started looking at, well, spent the last few years looking at car parking conflicts. So this is where um, housing is pitched against free parking. Um, and it's this flashpoint for urban change and for urban consolidation. So the quote I often use is, fight the towers or kiss your car park goodbye. And Robin asked me before, are you going to talk about car parking in regional centres? So I could, I won't today. Um, looking at the historical origins, though, of where these conflicts over car parking come from, what I found was through mechanisms like uh, post-war implementation of minimum car parking requirements, we've done a really fabulous job of planning for car parking in cities. I think the quote before from Eisenhower, you, are what you, you get what you inspect. I think that applies to parking. Um, as Donald Chute puts it, uh, minimum car parking requirements are a hidden tax on development to subsidise cars. If urban planners want to encourage housing and reduce traffic, why tax housing to subsidise cars? And that's effectively what we've been doing in the post-war period. A lot of our urban form, and at a practical level, a lot of our planning system, even now, it celebrates the low-density sprawl. Actually, I didn't say sprawl then. Low-density development, the separation of land uses, and the rights of private cars. And this is really the default, I think, against a lot of what other ideas are held up against and criticised. And so some things are definitely improving, but we have a default growth pattern, and these are furthering inequalities in the city. So that's inequality in access to affordable housing and to the wealth generated by housing, inequalities in services, particularly transport infrastructure. And most of our fixed rail system in Melbourne was built before the 1930s by private investors mostly and speculators. Public investment in public transport, even when it has grown substantially, that is not often, is definitely well outpaced by growth in population and housing development. One of the projects I'm now involved in focuses on the early delivery of transport infrastructure to new growth suburbs in Melbourne. The new suburbs, outer suburbs of Melbourne are expected to accommodate an extra half a million new homes in the next 35 years. I don't know if those projections are right but we'll go with it. Uh, the general trend there is about scarce lo local employment and inadequate or at least delayed and um, uneven public transport infrastructure. There are a lot of uh, planning and funding assumptions and barriers that tend to make it quite difficult to do transport-led development now. And I believe that early transport delivery is critical to address transport inequities and health disparities between residents of established well-serviced suburbs and those attracted to affordable housing on the fringe. I think a lot of us share that view. Part of that project is about identifying potentially more efficient and equitable ways for both the public and the private sectors to fund transport options to residents of new suburbs. In terms of how this all cross crosses over with decentralization and especially fast rail and rail oriented settlements, some of the critical questions I'd like to explore include, what can we learn from history about the advantages and also the pitfalls of all the past efforts at decentralisation and new towns in Australia. We have, for example, the Whitlam Area National Growth Centre Program, Albury-Rodonga, Campbellfield, Wangaratta, and we know some of them offhand, but I think research really needs to challenge some of that broad brush learning and anecdotes. Not, it's not good enough to just say Canada, Canberra is a bit boring. And I think there's a real opportunity to delve into some of those failures and successes and outright duds. Uh, there's the idea that Australia should be able to engage with a more nuanced evaluation of the role of new cities and new settlements was the subject of a recent conversation article I wrote with Rob Freestone and Julian Bolliter. In terms of transport specifically, which is really where I came into it, I'd like to see research on the successes and failures of past rail-oriented developments in Australia. What were, going back 100 years, the pitfalls of speculative transit-led developments and the advantages and long-term legacies? Also, I'd like to see specifically how past projects, both road and rail, have been funded and financed, who bore those costs, and long-term what the costs and benefits are. 
Uh, specifically, also, why did past fast rail projects for Australia falter? I mean, we all know this is not the not the first. So, really, an appraisal of what didn't didn't work, um, and also, what are the best practice examples, and what can we learn from the use of different finance models for transit-led development elsewhere? And London would be one example. More broadly, I'd like to question. To what extent our past decisions and policies have entrenched the current urban form and population patterns? I've recently been familiarising myself with the early history of transport-led speculation in Melbourne, so the spurious circle line, the Octopus Act, and there's some cautionary tales there, but on the other hand, the legacy is our, most of our rail network. Also looking at some of the transport studies from the 1970s and 1980s, the Loney Report, for example, and the triggers for mass public disinvestment in public transport at that time. And what strikes me reading those reports now is how that period of decline in rail is presented in, in these reports as though this was completely unrelated to previous decades of investment in roads and in car parking and is supporting a car-based urban form. It's like, oh no, rail is failing. I think it's disingenuous to default to this narrative of inevitable economic drive towards agglomeration of our major cities without at least reflecting on how active a role government policies and agencies have had in undermining the alternatives. And there's obviously larger economic shifts and employment drivers at play, but I th and I think there's a lot of valuable research to go on there. But I'd also even question the role of policy in some of those shifts in employment, even around agriculture. So to finalise, I grew up in Mount Clear, Ballarat, and both my parents are from Castlemaine, so very much regional. And I grew up also in decades in which it seemed to me that the express role of government was closing train lines rather than opening them. I have vivid memory of just the sense of everything shrinking, there was little, less, nothing. Um, I used to like looking at old street directories, which is the sign of a true nerd, but looking at the old tram and train net services that used to be in the area and just like, wow, it's another world then. But also schools, swimming pools, hospitals, pubs, shops, trains, whole towns. Everything seemed to be naturally diminishing in regional areas at that time. Looking back, I think there were obviously broader and global shifts at play, but that I also see that there are some really specific conscious decisions made to undermine some of those places. Like many people from Ballarat, I moved to Melbourne and I'm unlikely to move back because the weather is horrible. But I have bought a house in country Victoria in Elmore, which is past Bendigo, 150 kilometres from Melbourne actually. And we made that decision in large part because of the presence of a very small reinstated passenger rail service through to Echuca, which is possibly, hopefully, 50 years from now, maybe, on a future speculative fast rail track. I'd actually settle for a few extra trains, but there we go. But illustrating how small towns often welcome growth, Elmore still has a 1920s Babbitt-style Elmore Progress Association, rather than the metropolitan version of a community group, the Save Owl type, which is really about um, defence against growth. Elmore benefits from its proximity to Bendigo, but its volunteer-led community goes out of its way to advocate for services and to attract businesses. Having feet in both places is a reminder of how uneven the experience of growth and public investment in Australia has been, particularly since post-war period. As population growth just generally gets on the agenda again, it's well worth questioning and providing a forum, as with Balance Victoria, why this is the case, who pays for the status quo and not just criticise what the alternative costs might be, and what capacity, if any, we have to shift this as well as other inequalities of growth. And I'd like to reiterate that I prefer the name Committee for Everywhere Else. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker for today, um, as she's a distinguished professor, we've let her show some pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Billy Giles Corty, um, who is the director of RMIT's uh, Enabling Capability Platform, which to those of you who aren't at RMIT is basically the idea of how we do research together. Uh, and Billy's ECP is entitled Urban Futures. And Mark, if you can flip over to the other slide deck, that would be great. Thank you. and drop the house lights. Thank you.
so thank you. Jay asked me why I was a distinguished professor, and I said it was because I'm old, and I'm just proving that now because I'm using old fashioned technology. Anyway, um, could, a, could a decentralised Victoria uh, create a healthy, li more livable uh, Victoria? And I'm, I'm addressing that because actually I'm a public health academic, and I'm not a planner, I'm not a transport planner, I'm not an urban designer, I'm not an architect. And so in that sense, I'm quite unusual uh, to be interested in this topic, but it's been something that's been a passion of mine and has driven my research for the last 20 years. And it's interesting looking at uh, the possibilities. Now, we're all sort of a bit crestfallen because we've lost our mantle, and I think that's quite an interesting thing, and it's an opportunity for us to really think about a Melbourne. But it's really interesting when you look at this, uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit's indicators. For example, under culture and environment, uh, humidity and temperature rating, discomfort of climate to travellers are two of the indicators that are used to help uh, give us the 25% in terms of the um, in terms of this particular part of the, 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 the um, index. In terms of education, it's about availability of private education, the quality of private education. And in terms of stability, um, prevalence of crime, violent crime, threat of military conflict, threat of civil unrest. And in fact, Australia, um, compared to Ve v uh, Vienna, was five points below uh, Vienna in terms of this particular one, one of the major contributors to our loss of our mantle. Um, I guess my point is that um, when we look to the Economist Intelligence Unit, it's really not that useful for the way we think about our cities, the way we think about our cities in terms of the rapid growth that we're going through and the, the need that we need to, the need to, for us to change the way we're designing our cities. Now we've been thinking about this a lot in our team. We've um, done a study, a Creating Livable Cities study, uh, which we've measured, been measuring livability across Australia. And I'm, not, I'm only going to give you a snippet of what we've got for Victoria, uh, for, for Melbourne actually, because uh, we have a launch in a few weeks and I don't want to spoil you not coming to the launch of our scorecard for Melbourne. Um, but what we found was that all cities uh, across the country, they seem to value the idea of walkability and livability, but to be honest we don't have the policy frameworks in place to deliver it and I'm going to show you just a little snippet of the results. We don't have um, measurable st spatial standards, so telling us where we should be putting things in terms of local employment, housing, affordability. These are two things that are not even considered in our, in our planning policies in terms of the spatial distribution. And we do have, we find that when we look across the country, there's really con a lot of difference between the different cities, um, all the capital cities. Everyone has a different approach. Now, not really um, evidence-based in terms of what would actually produce the outcomes that we're seeking, walkability, livability, and there's great variation in the degree of policy ambition. So in this country, we have a problem uh, with the variation of policy, the lack of delivery of policy, uh, and this is something that we really need to be thinking about when we're thinking about the livability of a city. And let me just show you in terms of Melbourne's walkability. Liz has referred to this, and, and actually we've heard that too from Pat, about uh, you know, a failure uh, to deliver uh, a better city. Now, it's a bit green. This, uh, I think it must be the quality of the the screen. But in the middle of Melbourne you can see that you know, it's a very walkable environment. We've got the traditional sorts of street grids, we produce, we've got shops and services, we've got high levels of density and as a result of that this is a walkability map for Melbourne and it's, it's nice and green. But anything from yellow to red is where you would see no one walking. And you can see that as we've heard from our other speakers is that on the fringe of Melbourne we're actually delivering a city that has been designed purposely for the car and where we would see very little walking because we haven't designed it that way. Inner Melbourne's been designed for walking. Um, when we look at transport policy, our policy in Victoria is that 95% um, 90, of residents should live within 400 metres of a bus stop, 800 metres of a train stop and 600 metres of a tram stop. So this is our policy and the, and the target is 95%, which is terrific that we have that target. And what we see here in the, on the map on the left is all the residential areas with, um, within each suburb which is, accord, which is um, shaded according to the suburb average. So if you look over to the right, the legend there, anything that's sort of dark red or dark is really um, doing pretty well. Out on the fringe you can see um, the lower colours and that, the lighter colours and that's where we've got much less access to public transport, as you probably would expect, particularly when you look at the, the walkability, a lot of that's driven by the levels of density. 
And when we look at the number, the suburbs that are actually achieving the target of 95%, we see it's only really in the inner city that we're achieving uh, this target of 95% of residents has been within uh, proximity, the close proximity to public transport. So we have policy but we're not delivering it and as a consequence of that, that's really affecting the true livability of our city, the lived experience of our city. Um, and part of that, um, as we've ref seen referred to, is the idea of density. In our city, we have a big problem. We have at the top of them the, there is our, the levels of density. So it shows the darker the colour, the more dense. So you can see in inner Melbourne, uh, nice colours. You know, we're getting up to on average around 26 to 30 dwellings per hectare, a little bit higher in the real central areas. But out on the fringe, we're seeing you know five to ten dwellings per hectare, extremely low density. And then we look at what the policy target is, which is extraordinarily low in Melbourne, uh, 15 dwellings per hectare, far too low to deliver a walkable, livable city. Uh, we see that the only suburbs that are really the green is where we're actually delivering that civil level of density is really mainly just on the fringe. So even with the policies that we've got in place, a modest 15 dwellings per hectare, we have none of that being delivered on the fringe. And so that really is aff affecting uh, the livability of our city. So I guess I wanted to reflect on what this means then for Balance Victoria and this idea that we'll be moving into developing uh, greenfield sites, developments. I think for a start, one thing I'd like to argue is that the concept of livability is a really important one, I think. It's something that we all value, uh, but it needs to be centrally held. It needs to be the Premier or the Prime Minister needs to be holding this concept and asking everyone in the, in, uh, across the departments, the uh, multi-sector departments, what they're doing to contribute to creating a livable future because often the policies of different departments are at cross purposes with each other to be able to deliver the concept. So when it sits in planning, plan can, planning can draw the plan, but it can't populate the plan. It's other departments that will determine that. And that's why it's so important for this concept to be held centrally. And equally important when we're thinking about Balance Victoria. Um, we need to have integrated planning and regulatory framework that will create the level playing field for the private sector. And I think this is really critical. Uh, and when we talk about that, uh, we've heard that it's really important to have integrated land use and transport planning. But in this regional communities, what's going to be critical for the success of those communities is also land use, transport, and infrastructure planning. That needs to be planned up front. Otherwise, we'll end up, as we have on the fringe of our cities, uh, low density environments without um, an adequate infrastructure. I haven't given you all the other infrastructure results because I'm teasing you for our launch in, in October, uh, in September. Um, so what, looking to Europe, what can we learn? Um, one of the things I've um, been looking at, well, what can we learn from Europe in terms of the way it has gone about and has delivered uh, the more integrated planning, the higher density development that it has achieved? First of all, what we often see is vertical and horizontal planning. So vertical being all levels of government and horizontal across all the different departments. So rather than just you know, one department deciding on the livability of a city, it would be all the departments that are, con uh, are integrated together, but also all levels of government, what goes on locally, uh, at state and at federal, all contributing to the outcome. Um, it's interesting looking at the compact cities policy of the mid-80s in the Netherlands. It mandated that um, the minimum um, densities were 37 dwellings per hectare. Now in 2018, in, in Australia, Perth, uh, not Perth, um, Sydney, Brisbane and um, Melbourne, our policies still are at 15 dwellings per hectare. Extraordinarily low and of course that's why we're getting the outcomes that we are. And I think it's really important when we're thinking of these regional cities or these um, that we actually also think about protecting our agricultural land, something that has been done from the mid 80s uh, in the Netherlands. It's really important to put high density dwellings around public transport to, to make as many people as possible have access to the high, high quality public transport. And so as we build these cities, you know, what can we do around those transport hubs if we're going for high, high um, speed rail to have the high density around that to make it worthwhile? Um, the public transport needs to be delivered up front, which is obviously going to happen in this, in this case because that will be the driver of, of, um, of the development of these new towns. Um, the social infrastructure is not an afterthought. It has to be thought up up front. What you see often in Europe is that the temporary facilities are provided so that the, the, the facilities are there right from the outcome and people don't have to wait. And I think that's going to be really important for this circumstance. 
We need to have a commitment to the green wedges in cities and to make sure that there's adequate public open space. Um, the idea of mixed uses rather than mixed zoning. Um, mixed zoning was something that uh, we've had uh, for decades, well, for centuries now, but it, it's a problem because you have all the shops in one side, the separated of land uses, rather than the mixed uses, which is what we what used to see in cities, places like Fitzroy, there's lots of mixed uses, and so there's lots of places to walk to. Um, we need to be designing to increase access to destination and access by foot. Uh, in Europe, you see 35% of trips are by foot, 40% uh, are by, by bicycle. And what's interesting to me when I look at these from a health point of view, it's not just um, young people who are doing it. People in their 70s are still using um, cycling and bicycling, as, uh, cycling and walking as a way of getting around their city. Um, traffic management so that it makes the um, alternatives more attractive. Cycling infrastructure uh, and, and bike parking around the train stations. You see that when you go to Europe, everyone's got access to a, a bike park and there's lots of um, safe cycle paths that, to the public transport. And then it's cutting the number of mandatory uh, car bays. This is, a, this is Liz's issue. And finally, um, in, when we're talking about um, apartment standards, having bike parking incorporated into those. I think unless we're thinking about all the things that are going to make the place work, then we'll actually run the risk of ending up with, uh, there's lots of agricultural land, so let's just spread out. But I think what's going to make um, cities work in a way that we see they do as they do in Europe, where people are using alternatives, it's a much more healthy future, is if we're thinking about the, the legislative and the, and the regulatory framework that we can put in place to create this level playing field. So thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> thanks for coming along today. We will be in contact with you again via email uh, as we progress the development of the platform. Uh, we'll also be moving towards uh, increasing the media presence around this project. Uh, and so certainly you'll be hearing from us again. Thank you again to each of our speakers. Uh, they will be available for a small Q&A, uh, just sort of standing room only, if you'd like to do so. Uh, and otherwise, uh, we will see you next time we come and discuss Balance Victoria. Thank you. Thank you.